Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Let's try it again. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Friendship Missionary Baptist Church, who was kind enough to host this event tonight. This is a community democratic club event in partnership with several community organizations. We are happy to have you here tonight. My name is the Reverend Dr. Dante R. Quick, and I am the president of the Community Democratic Club. And we are happy to have our candidates here tonight and all of our concerned community members. For those of you who are watching us online through any of three different platforms, we are happy to have you here this evening. And we are pleased to have candidates here to explain their position on a number of issues. And we look forward to your feedback. You have the opportunity. Maybe you have a question. You can type it in on any of the platforms you have, and I'll try to make sure it gets to our moderator if time allows. So allow me to introduce the organizations that are part of this great event. We have with us tonight, as partners, the African American Alliance. Yes. The African American Alliance will be leading us in our timing of the event, informing the candidates of what time limits they have and when they are to begin. We also have uh, with us the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. They will be working with audience questions. And uh, if you ask a question online, I will make sure that we get your online question to the NAACP so they can communicate it through the regular channels. We also have a, one of the hosts, the Community Democratic Club, that handled the logistics for the event, and we are quite happy for all the hard work they put in. Tonight is a great, great opportunity. America is in perilous times. No matter what party you are in, we have reached a point where communication is nearing impossibility. Our country is so polarized that we are no longer exchanging ideas. We're simply exchanging anger. So I'm pleased that our candidates tonight have come with a very auspicious moderator who is going to lead us tonight in posting the questions and placing responses. A good man of Alpha Phi Alpha, would you help me in welcoming Mayor Osby Davis, who is our moderator. <laughs> Mayor Davis, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for coming out. Um, you know, it's, these candidate forums are always interesting because uh, a lot of people uh, are complaining about what happens, but they don't come out to talk or listen to the candidates. So thank you for coming out. Also, to the candidates, I want to thank the three of you for coming because uh, it shows that you don't take any vote for granted. Um, I think that there are reasons why people don't show up, but you know some of those reasons are not necessarily reasons that we ought to be accepting because we have a right to hear the views of everybody if we're going to make an informed decision. So I thank you for not taking the votes that are here in this room for granted. As you know, uh, from somebody with experience, every single vote counts. <laughs> so with that, I want to um, explain to you the rules, or you've probably heard them already, but we'll go over them again. Each candidate will have the opportunity to make a candidate statement that's three minutes. And uh, I should explain to you the card system before that. The green card means, down here in front, means that you go. The yellow card means that you have 30 seconds to finish. And the red card means the floor drops out and you're gone. <coughs> the second, uh, also candidates will have an opportunity to respond to three or four questions that have already been presented. Um, and you will have two minutes each to respond to those questions. Uh, each candidate will also have an opportunity after this round of the questions that we have, we'll have an opportunity to answer questions from the floor um, after just a brief pause in, in the um, questioning. Uh, and each of you will have uh, two minutes to respond to that question. Um, so with that, I'm ready to start unless you have some questions about the rules. Is there a close? Yes, you can have a close when we get to the end. <laughs> How about that? I don't want you to close when we get it. Yeah. You Five might get 30 minutes. seconds and you might get a minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. 
Okay, but the close will be after we have questions from the public, all right? Okay, so um, with that, unless I miss something, we are going to go ahead and start. And I'm going to ask the first question. I guess I'll just start from my right and go down. Let me start from my left and go down to the right. <clears throat> and then we'll come back again. And everybody will be stuck at least once with the first question. Okay. Yes. So I'm going to start with you, Supervisor. Oh, I guess I'm supposed to introduce everybody. We have on my left and on your left, Supervisor Aaron Hannigan, District 1. And we have in the middle, candidate for Supervisor District 2, K. Patrice Williams. And we have on your far right, we have candidate for District 2, Supervisor Rochelle Sherlock. Supervisor Hannigan, you're up. Well, good evening, everybody. I want to thank Friendship Missionary Baptist Church as well as all of the partners that are here tonight. Uh, this is an important forum, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to share my views and, and, um, and some of my experience as well. Um, many of you know who I am. I have lived in Vallejo now for 30 years. I'm actually a sixth-generation Vallejoan. And I'm one of those folks who is, um, I like to call myself a people person. I pride myself on uh, introducing, um, you know, me and my family to as many folks in my community as possible and to get engaged as soon as possible. I was raised by two parents who lived their purpose and their purpose was helping people. And so having that uh, in my background um, as my foundation for the rest of my life has really set me up to run for office, which my uh, father tried to talk me out of in 2006 uh, when I first ran for city council. I've been serving the city of Vallejo and Solano County now for going on 13 years. Um, I've been very fortunate to um, have an opportunity to do a lot of positive things in our community. One of the first things I did as a, as a county supervisor is I put forward a smoke-free campus policy throughout Solano County. So every, uh, every one of our buildings and parking lots and parks is smoke-free. I've, I've felt very strongly that we are helping people in terms of medical care, mental health care at our offices, and that a lot of the folks we're helping have compromised um, immune systems and so wanted to make sure that they were safe. I've been able to raise millions of dollars of new money coming into our county and it's not from tax dollars, it's from out of town money essentially. Uh, the Yoshidihi Winton Nation, uh, you might know them as uh, Cash Creek, is a relationship that I value tremendously. When I first met with them, um, I talked to them about the needs in my community and when I say my community, I mean my town, our town Vallejo. Uh, we have people who live in food deserts, we have folks who are food insecure, we have children who aren't ready for, for school by the time they get there um, and need a little extra help. Um, we have juveniles in our justice system who have made a mistake and need assistance uh, getting back on track. We have seniors in our community who have uh, who live in situations that uh, may not be in their best interest, uh, as well as might have some mobility issues. I've been able to raise money to put 1,500 pairs of walking shoes on seniors here in our city, and I'm very proud of the work that that does. Through the uh, million first million dollars, I purchased what is essentially a produce truck, and it is at our. Uh, clinics throughout the throughout the district. Um, you'll hear more. <clears throat> All right, uh, Miss Williams. Good evening. My name is Kay Patrice Williams. I am running for Solano County Supervisor District Two. Thank you to the Community Democratic Club, uh, the African American Alliance. NAACP and the Solano Black Chamber of Commerce. I am a member of most uh, of those organizations. Other ways that you may know me is as a relationship builder. You may know me as an action-based coalition builder, a business owner, a mother of a 17-year-old, a lobbyist, an activist, or a friend. But I want to give you a little bit about my background. 
my father, Andrew Williams, was an iron worker and a union man. And he would come home and talk about how his union brothers would fight for equal pay and promotions. Senior services took on a special meaning to me seven years ago when my mother passed away, the love of my dad's life, and my star north. We were able to keep my dad sheltered in place by accessing senior services for him, including transportations and access to a dialysis center. My husband is an Amazon driver. Our 20 year anniversary in moving to, the, to Vallejo, is, it just happened a month ago. We met at Howard University and we, I moved to Solano County to be with him, my best friend. We raised two boys and we've lived in Fairfield for the last three years. Today, I'm proud to say we also run a women's and children's transitional home. That's a shelter. I understand working families because I'm a working family. I understand community building because community building has been the foundation of my life. I understand small businesses because I've helped hundreds of small businesses thrive. My youth team and I have met many of you at your homes in Vallejo and Fairfield and Benicia. We care about the same exact things. We care about smart economic growth, accessible housing, addressing the homelessness epidemic. Thank you for having me. I look forward to answering your questions. If we don't question, we, we don't if I don't answer a question that you have, you can reach me through our website, www.kpatriceforsupervisor.com. All right, thank you, Ms. Sherlock. Testing, here we go. Um, I don't know if you want to reset the time. Are we good? Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Rochelle Sherlock, and I'm running for County Supervisor District 2. And my journey here actually started in um, my childhood because I was the daughter of a teenage mom, the oldest daughter of a teenage mom. I am a product of intergenerational cycles of poverty, dysfunction, and abuse. Uh, we moved 31 times by the time I was 20. Never completed an entire grade at one school until the fifth grade and then again um, in the seventh grade and then perhaps the 10th grade. Um, I know what it, uh, I've experienced childhood trauma. I uh, know how childhood trauma uh, lasts with us and extends through our journey and it helps kind of defines who we are, how, the hopes we have for ourselves, the dreams we have for ourselves. But it also in, 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 um, creates some of the, the challenges and barriers to creating success in one's life, to realize one's fullest potential. And because I have had to climb from that to the place where I am now as a business owner, um, successful business owner with a master's in psychology, I'm completing my doctorate uh, at George Washington University in human and organization development. Um, it was a long journey without any help. I, in my early 20s, decided that because of my childhood, I was going to do two things. One, I wasn't going to allow this cycle to repeat itself with me, for me. I wanted to be different than my mom and my grandparents before them. I wanted my child and children to have a different life. I wanted something different for myself. The second thing was I vowed that when I reached the sunset of my life, I was going to look back and be able to say that I made a difference, that my life counted that I touched somebody else's life, made some other child's life better, gave them an opportunity to succeed or see themselves in a positive light, helped protect women or children and individuals from violence and family violence or from elder abuse, but that it counted and that lives were changed as a result of what I have done. And from that time forward, I have 25 years in public service. I have done everything from, I started as a social worker, everything from being a youth counselor, working as a child protective services worker, a program manager in a child abuse and neglect prevention program, starting the Senior Coalition of Solano County, founding the Fall Prevention Partnership, which addresses senior injuries, 
um, to the award-winning Mini Medical School, which is all about health and activity, the Living Legacy Awards. I brought $6 million in to address re-entry services, so people that were transitioning out of jail back into the community actually had an opportunity, that they would have a place to go, a sober living environment, that they would get wraparound services and job training and substance abuse treatment and mental health. All of these things I've done, I've done through partnerships by bringing people together to identify the gaps, identify the challenges, and to create sustainable solutions. I'm running because we have many challenges in front of us, and it's my intention to do the same going forward. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to do the first question. I'm going to start with Ms. Williams. Work down and then back, okay? Uh, Ms. Williams, the first question is a two-part question. What are your thoughts on the status of black infant health in Solano County? And what do you know about promising black infant health programs in neighboring counties? I'm aware of black infant health because I am president and emeritus of BOAPA. And BOAPA, um, led now by uh, Deborah Dixon, is um, forefronting the charge in, um, in working with a uh, supervisor to Aaron Hannigan to, to, uh, to address that issue, black infant health. What I know and be, the reason why it became an alarm for us is because we were hearing from other, uh, other neighboring counties that we had turned away a huge um, block of money for black infant health. The way, the reason why this is important is because, um, and this was set, shockwave in our community, the black community, was because we know that mental illness um, is an issue in our county. And we know that when, when a woman is pregnant, they are carrying traumas and stresses for both them and their baby. I was talking to Jenny Hennef today, and she, she coined this term, um, two souls, one body two souls, one body. Which that, what that means is if there's a, a woman, a black woman, that is going through trauma, that is going through stressors, that are going through job loss, anything, that that woman, that baby is feeling it too. And to get in front of this, we have got to have very specialized services for black infant health. Because black women are seeing the highest count of black infant death than any other group. So that's why this is important, um, and I believe with Boapa and the collaboration with um, Chairwoman Erin Hannigan, we're going to get on top of this and figure out what's happened and make a change for next fiscal period. All right, thank you very much. You guys can clap. Oh. <laughs> uh, I had to wake you up. Okay. okay. All right, uh, Ms. Sherlock. Mm -hmm. So black infant health is um, really important because African American women's, actually the infant mortality rate is much higher for African American women's than any other ethnicity group. It's higher than for Latino women's, Asian women, or um, um, Caucasian women. Um, there has been a tremendous amount of malpractice uh, by doctors and medical uh, practitioners who when an uh, African-American woman comes to them and suggests that she's got pain or she's uh, uh, identifying some other symptoms, they're dismissing those symptoms, they're not treating it, they're not investigating it further as they would for someone who is, a, who is Caucasian or someone who may be Asian. Um, it's really important. The prenatal care for African-American women is much lower than it is for some of the other races, as well as the ongoing um, infant care for those individuals. It is a reflection of some of the disparities that occur throughout our country and other areas as well. And Black Infant Health really strives to, one, create a safe place for African-American women, pregnant and parenting African-American women and families, that includes fathers, to come, to have access to um, car seats, to have access to good prenatal care, to have access to um, good health care and education, to make sure that uh, they have, um, you know, like baby showers so that they can get things like um, the car seats, the baby, uh, not cribs, but um, all of the kinds of things that we need for children and caring for children. And they also have mentors and models, role models of people that they know and that they identify with for this. 
Um, addressing black infant health is absolutely essential in, in this county and across our country, and it's something that we have to take very seriously. We need to begin to hold medical doctors accountable, and it needs to be a, it is a promising practice, it's a great practice here in Solano County through um, Solano County Public Health. All right, thank you. <laughs> Supervisor Hannigan. I think they, uh, I think a lot of what is, what is about black infant health and the whys have been mentioned, but I just want to talk about what happened at the county. So our public health officer, Dr. Bela Matches, made a decision based on data. He's very much a data-driven kind of a guy. He's not a real emotionally intelligent man. I know some of you have met him and you understand this. Um, so he made a decision to forego the state version of black infant health. And the reason was is that the attendance was very, um, was lacking. So mothers would be referred, you had to, to get into the program before your 26 week of pregnancy, and then you had to attend, I think out of 15 classes, uh, maybe all but three or four or something like that. It was, it was very prescriptive and very difficult for moms to um, fulfill those requirements. So what he did is he's taken essentially a little bit more money from the state from another pot of money, plus the same money from the county that we had supplementing Black Infant Health as it was known prior, and has put together a program that is has four different um, aspects to it. One, it has the group uh, meeting aspect, which was the, the crux of the state version of Black Infant Health. Uh, two, it includes Healthy Families America, which is a home visiting portion where, the, where we have social workers and nurses that will go into the homes of the moms and work with them and their babies once a week until those babies are three years old. That's pretty amazing. Um, the other is that uh, they have one-on-one -on -one counseling as well as offer, are working to offer a doula service for the moms. So Black Infant Health is a very, um, a very uh, specific program for a very specific reason, and that is because uh, of allostatic stress. If you've heard of that term, allostatic stress, it's essentially uh, stress that is passed from generation to generation to generation from trauma that occurred um, a long ago, but also continued trauma that kind of continues to add up. And so I think, okay, so much to talk about. <laughs> All right, the next question I'm going to start with Ms. Sherlock. Solano County has a very large homeless and economic challenge, economically challenged uh, problem, uh, population, I'm sorry. How will you address the issue of homelessness and poverty in Solano County? Um, so this is the number one issue on my platform is to address homelessness because if we don't get a hold of it, it's going to continue to go out of control. First of all, what we need to recognize is that there are different reasons why individuals become homeless. In some cases, individuals are being priced out of the market, and there's a set of strategies for that. That's rapid rehousing, it's rental assistance, it's things like establishing a shared housing program or making use of existing housing stock, and people can actually have roommates that they're matched with. So it's, it can help us make use of that existing housing stock right away. Um, a lot of our veterans who have post-traumatic stress disorders, they may uh, actually end up also abusing substances as a result of the trauma. A lot of them end up homeless. Uh, we need to do, make sure that they're accessing federal, uh, veteran services, and we need to do a partnership similar to what happened out in Dixon with uh, Habitat for Humanity, and where we do a housing uh, for veterans. But the real issue that we see is those individuals that are chronically homeless, those housing encampments where there's a lot of pollution in the environment, the vast majority of them have serious mental health issues, and addiction issues. What we need to do is we need to make sure that there's enough shelter beds for them, that we have the wraparound services. We need a county mental health specialist to accompany law enforcement to those um, into those encampments and visiting the homeless so that they can actually assess them on the spot and connect them to services. Individuals with mental health issues actually need medication management. Many of them are not accessing their psychiatric medication and they're not being treated for it. And then we need to make sure that people can get plugged into detox and residential treatment so that law enforcement can begin to enforce a no housing ordinance. There are great programs that are, that are going on uh, to do that, um, jobs training. I know we also want to do make sure we have more reentry programs like the Prop 47 program that I was mentioning earlier because 60% of the jail-based program are actually homeless. If we don't do something for them as they're exiting jail, they're going to 
can actually end up back at the streets. So we need a partnership with labor, um, we need a partnership with uh, our local businesses to make sure that there's jobs and that we have living wage jobs so that individuals can actually begin to meet some of their needs while they're also getting the kinds of health and social services that they are entitled to through the county. Thank you. Okay, all of that and. Um, <laughs> It's, it's really been my goal is to partner with the cities in our county who want to actually address the homeless problems that they have. Uh, for everybody that is homeless, there's a number of reasons why they are. Uh, one of the things that <clears throat> I've been able to secure through the money from Yoshidihi Went Nation is $600,000 that goes to our family resource centers to help keep people housed. If you're a single parent and you work uh, in a minimum wage job and you're sick for a couple of days, you know what, you can't pay your rent. So you can go to our family resource center, pick up that difference and pay your rent and stay housed. We'd rather keep that way. Um, but in order for us to be successful, we're going to need to provide a number of different options. There's not a one size fits all. And so I truly believe, and I know we have somebody here from Vacaville, that it's, it's really important for the county to partner with the cities. And when I say partner, we make a financial commitment to help cities build housing, to build shelter, and then we also provide the health and social services those wraparound services that are going to help those who are mentally ill, those who uh, need job assistance, those who, who could easily get into rapid rehousing, but to help them find a way out of homelessness. Not everybody on the streets wants to be that way. They find themselves there, unfortunately, uh, over you know just bad decisions or bad things happen to folks. And so we need to help them where they are. Um, I think pigeonholing people into you know a Christian help center while it's a great place it's not for everybody or to say you know you you can't be here with your dog or you can't be here with your boyfriend you have to be married I mean we really have to be flexible about the housing options we're going to offer folks the city of Vallejo has done a tremendous job we've got the navigation center that's opening up in south um, south of town and that will house 125 beds will provide a place for folks to get a shower to to uh, check their email, etc., and then we also have 75 units and on Sacramento Street so. that we'll be partnering with. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you do. <laughs> uh, uh, Ms. Williams. Thank you. Homelessness is also an issue that is uh, near and dear in my heart. When I was in law school about 15 years ago, I interned for Gal then Mayor Galvin Newsom's Homelessness Connect in San Francisco. And I was interning there because I didn't see a huge homeless problem here. 15 years later, it's a crisis here. So I feel like this, um, this is a priority. My background in only, not only working with Homelessness Connect and seeing wraparound services and housing work together in a very successful way. Um, but only not only do I have that, but I have also affordable housing experience. I've been in, I was in affordable housing for five years after law school. My husband told me to get to work and pay off the debt of law school. And so affordable housing is where I landed. And it was powerful because I was able to see and be a part of transformable, transforming housing that included all income levels. It wasn't just low income. It wasn't just, uh, uh, high, um, I'm sorry, it wasn't just lo very low income and low income, but it was also working uh, level housing. It was working housing, workforce housing, thank you. Um, so to see all those levels and also see that you could also have a model that is sheltering and all those with those shelters roll in wraparound services and those shelters are short term so after a year people are moving learning the skills and moving into the workforce housing that can be done and that can be successfully done here in Solano County we need that type of help. All right thank you. <laughs> the next question will start with Supervisor Hannigan. Um, this is a question regarding transportation it says the Interstate 80 corridor is crowded and congested during commute time and in the morning and evening. What will you do to address this issue? <coughs> Recognizing that we have Salon Transportation Authority which addresses those issues, 
what are your views about what should happen with STA in order to address that issue? Well, I think we should have the jobs move here to Solano County. So the reality is that 64% of the working folks in uh, Solano County commute outside of the city for work. And a lot of those folks who are on our highways do not live in Solano County. They're coming through Sacramento or vice versa to get to, to their job. Um, there are a number of ways to reduce traffic or at least make the flow happen a little quicker. Um, uh, the uh, lanes, the fast track lanes where you have the going through the city. We have a real challenge though here in Vallejo. I mean, let's talk about these freeways. They cannot expand any more than they already are. We, we're going to have three lanes and that's it, go in each direction. Um, until Caltrans puts together their, their wish list of things to do, and one of them has been said over the years when we were on the council, and that is uh, dropping some of the off-ramps and the on-ramps so it's not such a uh, uh, thread the needle. Kind. If you taught anybody how to drive in Vallejo on the freeway, were you like scared to death? I mean, I was. So, yeah, so it's problematic. But I also think we need to look at public transit. We're very fortunate here in Vallejo that we have a ferry system that is hugely successful and is taking people, whether it's for work or for pleasure, from here to San Francisco and back. Uh, we have the Capital Corridor, uh, which is a train system that we can pick it up the train in Susun or Martinez, and we can get to pretty much anywhere you need to go with some connectors here and there. Our local um, Soul Trans system will take you right to BART. It's a pretty quick trip. And then once you get on Mart, you have access to most of the Bay Area. So if we can really encourage people to use these public transportation options, we're going to slow, we're going to reduce the um, the delays on the freeways. Also, just so you know, not just with 80, but I've been working on State Route 37, Highway 37 for most of you. We have short-term and long-term solutions. They're both very expensive. The long-term being extremely expensive. I'm just going to let you know that it's like in the upwards of eight billion dollars to do what it is we want to do. And you fell asleep. Foster. <laughs> uh, somebody give uh, Foster some coffee, would you? <laughs> this way. Thank you. So I also see when you, when you indicated that question, my first thought was, boy, we need local jobs here. We need living wages here. We need uh, pathways uh, to small businesses here. That's how I was able to come out of the super commuter of two, one and a half to two hours each way a few years ago. I, I worked in San Francisco and I spent three hours at least in traffic every day. And that affected my quality of life, the quality of life of my family. I had a husband that I barely knew. And, um, and weekends where I really had to spend the weekends recuperating. So the, the, the difference is I was able to make that change by working here. And it is a challenge because working here, I didn't make as much as commuting to San Francisco. That's why most of us did it. So breaking that super, that super commuter cycle to me is, is absolutely a low jobs, higher living wages here. Also, we talked about public transportation. So very quickly, I am, I wanted to make a change in public transportation. So I was appointed to the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, um, MTC, a few years ago. And one of the areas that we work on is barriers to access in public transportation. So we talk about all those barriers for seniors, for communities, they call them communities of concerns, and um, and low-income individuals, and we work on these issues together all the time um, and, uh, and address those barriers to services. Another point that I wanted to mention um, is about the engineering of our on-ramps and off-ramps. It's not something that I thought of by myself. I was having, I was having a transportation conversation and some engineering. Okay, time is up. Yes, sure. uh, yes, absolutely. So I agree that we need to uh, make sure that we're bringing jobs here. Uh, focus on economic development and making sure that we have living wage jobs, livable wage jobs here is really vital to ensure that people can actually work in the same county in which they um, live. 
But in addition to that, you know what, we need to start work making sure that people can do telecommuting. And I think Solano County, as, an, as a major employer, can do more in terms of having their employees do a lot of telecommuting. Um, despite what a lot of major employers believe, people are generally more productive when they work from home. Telecommuting is actually a wonderful way for people to enhance quality of life for individuals. They can spend more time with their families, more, times at, more time at home, and also be more productive than they are when they have to spend so much time on the road. So I would be a very big champion of telecommuting. Uh, we do need to improve the transit to arrive on time um, and so that people can make the right connections. There's Sol the Solano Express, which goes down 80, can take people all the way to the BART station. With the Solano 360, that's fairgrounds project, there's a proposal to include a transit center there. That transit center actually will help make some of those connections a little smoother because as people come in from Vacaville into Fairfield into Vallejo, if everything's right along the 80, they can get on and off quickly and then head over to those connections with BART and the ferry system. Uh, so I think that's going to be a really important piece. The other thing is we need to make sure that we raise awareness around commuter programs. The Solano Transportation Authority actually has commuter programs. And that's where people can um, you do it the park and ride. They get a commuter bus or shuttle. They can carpool. Um, they can actually call the Solano Mobility Program and ask them, how do I get to some place? What are the commuting vans that are available? Um, we need to do uh, build high-density mixed-use development going forward so that actually people can live and work kind of in the same area. So if we're not spending a lot of time driving from our home actually to the grocery store or to retail, but we can do it right there like in some of the bigger cities, that will also help get some of the people off the roads. Um, and ultimately, I think we need to encourage our, our major employers to provide shuttle vans um, like Genentech for, to shuttle time, employees time to work. <laughs> okay, um, the next question, we're going to, Ms. Williams, you will start this question. What is your experience in creating results-based programming and securing grant funding for such activities? And if you have such experience, give us an example. Results-based programming. Results-based programming. Have any idea what I'm talking about? A, an example just came to my mind. Let me okay. let me roll with it. Okay. Um, so I immediately thought of Solano County. I just left the Health and Social Services building today, and on that, on the, when you walk inside, it's in big letters, strengthening families. And my thought just now, when you just asked me that question, was thinking about strengthening all families. And the example that comes to mind to me is the homeless shelter. Um, the, the women's and children's transitional home that I own. And that has been pretty interesting because it's, it's not just housing. Um, it's a, I, my husband and I have to work as almost case managers in building up these women and children that are in these homes. This is everything from how to cook, how to clean, how to um, budget, um, how to um, uh, uh, maintain ourselves, that's the best way I'm going to say it. So, so it's really getting to the core of who these families are and really building them up. So that's what came to mind when you asked me about um, uh, results, uh, results based programming is really strengthening families. All right, thank you. Ms. Sherlock. Uh, absolutely. So, uh, results-based programming or evidence-based program is really uh, programs and practices that are based on research and shows that there's positive outcomes as a result of those programs and practices. I have been involved in results-based programming almost my entire career, actually early on from a child abuse and neglect prevention program where we applied the David Olds um, nurse family practitioner model for home visitation for young families, uh, both pregnant teen, pre pregnant and parenting um, families, where you would bring nurses, um, home visitors into the home to work with them both uh, in throughout the pregnancy as well as um, uh, when the child was young. So we established that. We also established a, a perinatal multidisciplinary team where the multidisciplinary team actually assesses the particular cases and makes sure that we're addressing specific needs of the family. Um, more recently, I actually brought in $6 million for, from Prop 47 from the Bureau of State Community Corrections, and that is to create a reentry program to address the reentry gap. 
Through that process, we identified what the evidence-based practices and programmings were. And, and in particular, and when you're dealing with um, the justice-involved population, you need to be addressing the criminogenic needs um, of the individual to ensure that we reduce recidivism. So there's a lot of programming out there that people would say we, we should do um, things like maybe it might be like around meditation, it could be around um, you know parenting education. Those kinds of things, while those are nice, don't necessarily immediately address the criminogenic needs that would reduce the recidivism. So the Prop 47 program was based on evidence-based practices. Um, I did a tremendous amount of research. We brought in all the experts from legal services, the public defender's office, the jail, the sheriffs. Um, we engaged formerly incarcerated individuals to identify the gaps and challenges. And then we addressed this program that is, I'm very pleased to tell you, is uh, yielding incredible results. We've had 40 people graduate from this program. They're doing phenomenal. We have about 20 to 30 more that are midway through. They're staying clean and sober. They're not reoffending. Time is expired. Thank you. So the county has three programs I want to highlight. Um, I want to highlight all three, but I'm really going to talk about one in depth. The Center for Positive Change, if you know about the Center for Positive Change, it's around the corner at Tuolumne Street. It's for adults who are previously incarcerated. It's pro they're on probation, and it's providing them all kinds of services and resources so that they will be successful in, and not uh, recidivate. I've been to, I can't tell you how many graduations, and every time, uh, one or two folks who graduated, and I'm talking like 50 people, will say this is the first time I've ever finished anything. And there are folks that won't even be there because they have jobs already. So the other one is our SB 1022. It's a bill. It's, it's you know, it's, it's Sacramento speak. But what we did with SB 1022 money is we built a training facility on our at our jail facility on Claybank. We're teaching people how to weld. We're teaching them how to be carpenters. We're teaching them how to program, um, how to do a variety of things when they come out of the jail system. And so uh, that is uh, results-based programming. The one I really want to focus on, and I'm going to get bring a big plug for it, and that's the First Five Center. If you're familiar with First Five, it is the cigarette tax money that goes to uh, commissions. There's one in every county uh, that address the needs of children from the age of zero till their sixth birthday. We're opening up the first First Five Center here in Vallejo, and it is going to be full of results-based programming. It was a data-driven decision to come to Vallejo because we looked at nine data points uh, throughout the county to what which would identify children who are being raised in, in poverty and the two locations where we found the most was in Rio Vista and Vallejo well of course we chose Vallejo and then we centered we put the center where it's at because it's a census track where 68 percent of the children in that neighborhood are being raised in poverty this is a place where parents and children come children learn to read talk sing to be prepared for when they go to school and we're also going to help parents but don't tell them Time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's the, that's the end of the formal questions we have in writing. We're going to take a moment to allow um, the audience to prepare questions, and they're going to come, come up. In the meantime, Lynette Henley, where are you? Okay, Lynette Henley is going to share with you about the proposition. Yeah, we'll, we'll okay, so I'm going to make a little commercial. <laughs> So the First Five Center is opening this Thursday at 11 o'clock. We're having our ceremony. It's 11 from to 2. The ceremony starts at noon. It's at 3375 Sonoma Boulevard. If you know where Dee Dee's is and the Dollar Store and Big Five Sports and um, the Bank of America building on Sonoma, it is in that building. You're not going to miss it. We're expecting over 300 people to be there. So come on down Thursday, 11 to 2. Uh, good evening. Uh, I am Lynette Henley, and I'm here to give a quick um, overview, I think I have like two minutes, maybe three, to talk about Prop 13. How many of you know the, Prop, the new Prop 13 that's going to be on the ballot? I got one, two, a couple of hands. Great. For Vallejo, this is, I'm supposed to do pro and con, but for Vallejo, for Vallejo, this would be a great piece for us to vote yes for. It authorizes bonds for facility repair construction and modernization of public preschools, K-12 schools, community colleges, university, and, um, and changes the statute for legislation. So many of you went to school in Vallejo, have grown up in Vallejo, and we have some aging schools. 
Um, if you think about the new schools that we built over the years, it's been Wardlaw, Lake Cove, and Bethel. I think I covered all of them. That's it. And the school I teach at is Hogan, and that was built in the 40s, late 40s, early 50s. And so um, a yes on this would allow for bonds to be floated, 15, mil 15 billion in general obligation uh, bonds to fund school, fund school, community colleges, university facilities uh, projects. Um, in addition, the school district and the community college districts would be able to change um, some of the authorization that now limits um, how much they can request and how high they can, um, when developers come in, how much they can request from the developers in support of building new facilities here. So that, that would raise the limit on that. Um, Prop 13 um, is going to do, is there to repair uh, schools, build new schools, uh, do abatement of mold, asbestos, believe it, if, you're, if the school was built in the 50s, there's some of the best asbestos there. We just uh, have to worry about when you knock down a wall or change a classroom or uh, change the uh, lighting in there, usually there's asbestos there. So those that are, um, and then all of the education family is in support of this proposition. Teachers, um, professors, uh, even the firefighters and the police are in support of this uh, proposition. So those that are against, I'll let just say that the Harvest Jarvis Taxpayer Association, who's against anything that has to do with money being funded, uh, because in their mind it goes against Prop Thir the old Prop 13. So what would happen if this doesn't pass is that they would not be able to float the bonds to um, allow for the additional uh, building of and abatement for schools, preschools, uh, K-12 schools, community colleges, and universities. I think I've taken my two minutes. Um, are there any questions? Okay, great. So um, I'm taking off my fair and unbiased opinion. And this is the school teacher here. Please vote yes on Prop 13. Thank you. Okay, I'm back. I got some news for you guys. <laughs> now comes the hard questions. All right, I'm going to uh, ask each of you, there's three questions here, so each one of you are going to get one of these questions. So I have the first one on here, um, and I'm going to ask this of um, Ms. Williams. How will you ensure that youth and young adults, specifically African Americans, have access to internships and jobs? Thank you for that question. I, everything that I do, I wrap our youth around it. Um, I'm known for that. I go to schools, I speak, I've been a guest teacher, and I am crazy about our youth. And they have joined me in full force. I have 77 volunteers, and 19 of them are youth, and they manage us almost. Uh, they have a lot of energy, and in talking to them and being able to talk to them every week, what I know is that they, A, they want mentorship, and B, they want internships. And we have this unique situation with Solano County to, in the departments, and the, the diversity of departments, health and social services, public health, um, workforce development, all these great departments, and our youth can have internships with our departments. They can, they can be 17 and 18, come for the summer, spend the summer with us, learn all these skills, and leave at the end of the summer with these real skills and these real points on their resume that make them uh, ready to go and really um, highly desired in the workplace not only for Solano County, but outside of Solano County as well. Um, also, mentorship. What I've learned is, is they want to be with us. They want us to be part of our lives. They want to have access to us. They want to be able to call us and ask us questions. So people on my team have become 
almost mentors to these youth that are walking with us and campaigning with us and talking with us. We need to do that on a big, a large scale all throughout the county. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, Ms. Sherlock, there are many issues in Solano County regarding community and law enforcement relationships. What issues have you identified and what would you do to address these issues? So as far as community and law enforcement relationships, we know that there has been a horrible history here, and particularly in the city of Vallejo, with a, a, a disproportionate number of African Americans killed by our Vallejo Police Department. Um, I would say that, uh, and we see, we see this kind of um, uh, travesty occurring across our country as well. One of the things that I think what we need to do is, first of all, is we need to make sure that um, the city of Vallejo has the resources so that they can become fully staffed. I understand that one of the problems that they have had is not having enough um, uh, police officers and not providing enough training and support to those police officers being overextended. Also, I understand they're having a retention issue. I believe that we need to support community policing and programs that really help police get connected more towards our communities and our youth. And um, some of that, I know there's the midnight basketball, there's um, the bicycle rodeos that, that they host, but I think we need to do even more than that. Um, you know, the research shows that when we spend time with people that are different than ourselves, then it begins to reduce some of the biases that, some of the implicit and unconscious biases that govern our behavior, and particularly in split decision reactions. So I, um, on the law enforcement side, we need to see more um, de-escalation training, more implicit bias training, um, more support and greater staffing. I actually, long term, I would like to see all of our local PDs and um, uh, to actually begin to recruit, recruit and cultivate individuals who will go into law enforcement so that we actually have people who live here in Vallejo, including African Americans, who become our police force here in Vallejo because they're from Vallejo, they live in Vallejo, they're committed to Vallejo, they have a relationship with Vallejo. I think that there will be a lot, that will go a long ways to enhance the relationships between law enforcement and the community. Thank you. Supervisor Hannigan, this question is for you. Solano County Mental Health has programs specifically to ensure Filipino and Latino communities access their services. Is there a program being planned for the African Americans? Well, when I served on the Mental Health Advisory Board, um, we did a survey of, uh, it was a pretty in-depth survey, again, it come, came down to results-based programming, essentially. And what was identified was that uh, folks in Latino, as well as in Asian, Filipino families, um, were least likely to identify as having a mental illness, and therefore would, be, would go untreated. And so that's the reason why that is highlighted. That was a part of their annual uh, report out to the, um, to the Board of Supervisors. But I agree, I think every community, um, I think every person has, um, you know, could, could find themselves with a mental health illness. I mean, I, I lived with depression for a while after I was uh, notified that my grandmother was dying of cancer and then and I sought treatment. Um, I also uh, stopped the treatment and then started back on treatment when I found out my mother was dying of cancer. And uh, because I needed to be able to be a mom and go to work and communicate and take care of my family members and not be in this puddle or not want to have to get up in the morning. And I think we can probably all kind of relate to a little bit of that. And, you know, just for me, it's about de-stigmatizing de de mental health illness. Um, it, it is not something to be afraid of. It is something that we need to recognize. We need to recognize it in our family members and our friends, and we need to help them seek, uh, seek support and to seek care. Uh, one of the things that I'm very concerned about is parity. We talk about parity in terms of uh, mental health illness versus medical care. Um, our hospitals are very quick to offer medical care, but not so quick to also offer the same quality or the same amount of mental health services. And we need to demand that as a community. I know I uh, advocate for mental health uh, dollars coming to our county so we can address mental illness in a much bigger way. 
All right, thank you. I am going to uh, ask the next, qu next question of uh, Ms. Sherlock. Are you familiar with the current gaps in services and needs and substance abuse programs? And what will you do to change or strengthen this? Absolutely. So we have some serious, serious gaps in terms of substance abuse treatment. Um, one of the things that we wrote into, that I wrote into the Prop 47 grant for the Bureau of State Community Corrections was actually to establish a, a detox center and a residential treatment so that when people seek treatment here in the county, they're not shipped out of the county to receive those services, but that they can provide it right here. We actually um, don't really have much in the way of those services at all. We have a detox residential treatment here in Vallejo. Um, while we have some sober living environments and we have some substance abuse kinds of um, counseling and services through like healthy partnerships, um, AA, NA, those kinds of supports, the actual detox and residential treatment is really, um, really limited. So there's a couple of things that we can do. First of all, on the federal government, um, we can tap into the drug Medi-Cal dollars and, and the county has chosen to do that. What it's going to do is it's going to mean that Medi-Cal will pay for case management for individuals as well as their treatment. So that people can get treatment and they don't have to pay for it. If they, you know, if they qualify, they can actually receive the substance abuse treatment. So that's going to be going into the partnership um, health plan. It's actually going to be the one administering that. And I'm hoping that the, the, the um, delivery of service will be smoother. We also need to um, address some of the system issues within the county. So for example, there were some barriers for people accessing substance abuse services just by the way that recently was set up. We had to work really hard to advocate that individuals that were in jail actually received an assessment of substance abuse needs so that as soon as they left the jail-based program, they could actually be immediately connected to substance abuse treatment services. And that was a lot of work because there's certain kinds of barriers inside the county sometimes. The county doesn't always think outside of the box. There's great programs going on, but there's also these barriers that actually can mean the to, can make or break it for an individual who is seeking treatment. Um, the other thing we have to address a little bit is NIMBYism and finding an actual location where we can have the detox and residential treatment facilities. People absolutely Time. need this. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Williams, uh, next question is for you. Do you have a plan to close the gaps in mental health services? And do you have any past experience? So, I have a background um, where I like to go into different departments. This is what I've done. I've gone into Solano County departments. And when I meet with different department heads and different managers, what I ask them is, as the county supervisor, next county supervisor, what can I champion for you? What gaps are there? What barriers are there? Where are we not using dollars correctly? So when I hear that question, I think of just the overall of all of these, the body of all of these departments and the list that they have given me. I feel that day one that I can walk in with a plan, a 100 day, 120 day plan where I can really bring together all of these gaps and have conversations about it. When we go into budgeting conversations, we can have real, deep conversations about where those gaps lie. So not just touching mental health, but touching public health, touching um, all types of services. So that's my answer. All right, thank you. <laughs> Supervisor Hannigan, this is the last question, I believe. Okay. Um, you speak about bringing jobs into Vallejo and Solano County. What types of jobs should come into the city, I'm sorry, come into the area, and how can uh, the local education system, K-12, and college prepare everyone for, those, for this future? Thank you for that question. Um, I, th I, think it's a, I think it's really a much bigger answer, and that is um, for, for many years, probably decades, uh, we have been graduating students uh, at a rate of about 65 to 70 maybe even as high as 75%, which means there's a whole bunch of kids that are graduating from our high schools. 
And uh, those numbers have improved over the years, but this first five center is really geared to helping prepare children to be ready to go to school and ready to learn. And this is a, a very dedicated, focused effort, and it's the kind of effort we haven't had in a long time. If we can get our kids through school and, into, and out of high school, then they're gonna be ready to either go off to college or go off to a training, of some sort, a skill training, um, a, um, a labor training, whatever it might be that they're interested in, we need to support our children in that way. Um, and then once they're done, we need to have those jobs. And that's been one of the challenges here in Vallejo, is we have lost a lot of jobs over the years. Let's think about Mare Island. But um, we're also gaining jobs there on a pretty regular basis. Most of them are blue collar. There are a few white collar jobs as well uh, with, the, with the college and a couple of other things. But we really need to focus on jobs that our students here in our community can be prepared for. Um, I serve on the Solano 360, which is the Fairgrounds Redo, essentially, uh, implementation committee. And my goal for that site is one, it includes head of household jobs, it includes jobs for our youth, and it includes a place where you and I are gonna wanna go and hang out and spend money, and folks regionally are gonna wanna come and, and spend money there. That is gonna be the, the county's biggest economic development site and job center aside from our own offices. So um, I think stay tuned for that space. Uh, the, really the goal is to ensure that the people in our community are prepared for the jobs that are coming their way. And some of those jobs, we don't even know what the titles are or what they're actually going to be. They've changed so much over the years. All right. Thank you very much. Um, that concludes the questions that I have. And each of you are going to be given an opportunity to close. You have three minutes to close. But I want you to think about a question as you close. We sat and listened to you, and all of you seem to be very aware of the issues. You seem to have a good uh, handle on what needs to be done and what you would like to see done. And so tell us, as you close, what distinguishes you from somebody else who's running for the same office? Why should we choose you versus the other person? No, you don't get to start this time. You can start at the end of the Sherlock, and you get to finish. So first of all, thank you for letting me be here with you all. What distinguishes me is 25 years of public service and getting things done. I have founded or co-founded well over a dozen initiatives that have changed the lives of uh, youth, children, families, and seniors. And we're talking about not just hundreds, but thousands of lives in the programs that I've started. Um, as an example of some of those, uh, the Dynamic Aging Conference, the Award Mini Mini Medical School, uh, started senior um, poverty programs, uh, Savvy Saving Seniors, a network of care, what we advocated for to increase that. I was a co-founder of the Volunteer Center. I'm a co-founder and chair of the Solano Commission for Women and Girls. I was a member of the Solano Safety Net uh, Steering Committee addressing poverty. I uh, started that senior poverty group. I was a member of the Real Estate Fraud Advisory Team. I've worked on elder abuse and, and neglect prevention and fraud prevention. I recently um, started a wildfire preparedness effort and founded and am chair of the um, Green Valley Fire Safe Council, which is addressing wildfire safety, which is a key issue here in the community. I've also done several disaster preparedness events so that um, residents actually have the tools and resources that they need to um, be prepared in the event of a disaster. I brought in the $6 million for reentry services. Um, I started a perinatal multidisciplinary team. I have done turnarounds for Child Abuse Prevention Council for Family Violence. Everything that I do, I have worked with literally every single department within the county, and I've done that over the number of uh, quite a few years in my work. I'm also an organizational effectiveness consultant because early on, remember, my goal in life is to make the lives better for other people, to make our community better, to make it stronger. And I found that some of the systems and organizations that were supposed to help families or communities that were struggling, disadvantaged, or dysfunctional were every bit as dysfunctional, if not more dysfunctional, than the families we were trying to serve. And if we don't have healthy systems, if we don't have a vision for what we want to see and what that looks like, how we work together to actually achieve those goals, if we're not creating metrics and monitoring our progress, if we're not tracking the resources and making sure the resources go down and reach the individuals that they were intended for and um, meet the greatest needs if we're not generating more resources or we're putting up some kind of bureaucratic barriers uh, that prevent people from accessing those resources so that they can become the individuals that they want and live their best lives in this county then we have failed 
I have donated over $100,000 in pro bono consulting services to nonprofits and community groups throughout Solano County, and I've done far more beyond. I know how to take leaders and boards and help them to um, break down silos. I help them address and make sure that the organizations and employees are engaged and we have healthy, robust cultures. And I know how to bring people together in collaborative alliances, private and public partnerships. I have leveraged so many resources that, and, and we held so many events that weren't done, funded by taxpayer dollars by bringing businesses together and Time. funding them. Thank you. I'm the most qualified. Thank you. Well, I, I'd like to say that it's because I listen to you. I listen to my community. I listen to the people that I represent because you have elected me time and time again to be your voice, whether it's at the city council or it's on the board of supervisors. And why? what has been the result of that listening? Well, I ran out and I got some new money so we can have a mobile food pharmacy, so we can address food insecurity issues throughout our community where we have food deserts and people do not have access to fresh produce so that they can put good food in their body and be healthy. I put together a transportation program. It's our mobility vans. It's for people living with disabilities and it's for seniors. Those vans are, for, are run by our nonprofits. Um, here in Vallejo and throughout Solano County to make sure that people have access to the places they want to go. We're not limiting it just to the doctor or just to the grocery store. You can go visit your girlfriends. You can go visit your, your, your church. You can go to the Florence Douglas Center and hang out with your friends. Um, the most recently, shedding light on the, on the changes that we made to the Black Infant Health Program. I started to talk about that. It's a much uh, bigger conversation than there's enough time, but um, I was alerted to the fact that there were changes made and the, and the community was not brought along in the process. I wasn't even brought along in the process. And so I listened to you. I brought you together with the person who made the decision. We unpacked that decision. We identified what were the problems with the fact that the decision made was made and the community was not, did not know what that meant. They thought it meant something else. And so we had the original meeting and then we had a follow-up meeting with community members and with the decision maker so that we could understand that we were actually getting a better deal than we were before. And we're going to monitor it. We're going to continue to follow up with it because you are the folks who are being affected by the program and I want to make sure that you're getting the resources and services you need because the reasons why a Black Infant Health Program exists are not good. But the results can be awesome. And so that's a goal. I'm concerned about you. I'm concerned about my community. I want to make sure we have jobs for everybody that lives here. I want to make sure that we're able to get to those places we need to go. Um, I, I can tell you I have a lot of endorsements. The ones that mean the most to me are the personal ones. You know, we, I can get an elected to endorse me, but I want to know that, that you endorse me that you know that I'm working for you every single day. I lead with integrity. I will never make a promise I can't keep. And I always will let you know where I stand on the issues when asked. And I'm available. I'm available every Friday at 9 a.m. on the waterfront. You can come walk in with me, or you can meet me at the Florence Douglas Center at the second Wednesday of the month. Thank you. <laughs> you guys are going to hit me after this, and I didn't set the rules. <laughs> All right, Miss Williams. My name is Kate Patrice Williams. I am running for county supervisor, District 2. We are living in divisive times, in both national -wide, nationwide and in Solano County. Up until we, we've done about 10 forums, and uh, the last seven, we've had someone here that called me unqualified. I have degrees in law and economic development. I have a background working for IBM. I have a background working for the number one tech company, DoubleClick. DoubleClick was bought out by Google. I was a part of that internet boom. Um, I have served on boards. I have served this community with grace. Who we need on a county level in District 2 is leadership with heart, leadership with compassion innovative ideas, collaborative approaches, and with a business and a legal background. 
Because of you, this community, I have out fundraised both District 2 candidates again. One of the candidates is incumbent. We together, 500 of you, have supported my campaigns with $34 or less. There are days that, days that I come to the treasurer and she pulls out envelopes with crinkled dollars in it. $4, $3, $7. That's our youth. That's our homeless. That's people that just, they don't have much, but they've invested in this campaign. I have been endorsed by over 150 elected, formally elected, community leaders, faith-based leaders, educators, small business owners, including assembly members Tim Grayson, Jim Frazier, and Chairwoman Erin Hannigan. I have also earned broad-based community support. My endorsements include the Napa Solano Central Labor Council, the Napa Solano Building Trades and Construction, Firefighters Local 1186, OE3, the Iron Workers, Benicia and Vallejo Police Officers Association. How does a new candidate trust, get the trust and endorsements of so many? How does a new candidate raise those dollars? Because I'm genuine, because I'm community driven, because I'm collaborative, because I'm inspired by our youth, I'm smart, and I have a heart for the community. Mail ballots are out now. I'm asking for your vote. Election day is March 3rd. I'm asking for your vote to be the catalyst of change. Thank you. Before we close, I understand that we have a video with candidate uh, David Isom, who is a candidate for District 5 Board of Supervisors. Hello, my name is David C. Isom, and I am a candidate for Solano County Board of Supervisors for District 5. You may know me in my role within the faith community as the senior pastor of St. Stephen Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, where I have served since 2007. You may also know me from my role working with the young people in our community, having served on the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District's governing board since 2010. You may also know me from my work within our community concerning domestic violence and sexual assault. I'm running for Solano County Board of Supervisors because leadership matters. I'm a proven leader that gets things done. We must address the homelessness crisis that we are experiencing in meaningful ways. We must partner with those agencies that are successfully providing resources to this community. There are many reasons why persons have found themselves without a home. Some is because of a living wage, some is because of alcohol and or drug abuse, and others have just fallen on hard times. We can help them if we work together as a community to do so. I also want to talk about affordable housing, which has become a problem again in our area, which is contributing <coughs> to the homelessness crisis. There are foundations and there are agencies that provide affordable housing, and I believe that we need to connect with those agencies in order to take care of those less fortunate in our communities. Job creation is something else that we need to uh, deal with in Solano County. I'm interested in a small business incubator partnering with community colleges and other agencies across the county so that small businesses can get a good start and become successful. Visit my page, www.davidcison.com, to learn more about me and what I'm doing. Thank you. I need your vote, March 3rd. Bye. Okay, 
Pastor Quick is going to close us out, I'm sure. Um, but before that, I want to say to each of the candidates, on behalf of the African American Alliance, the uh, Community Democratic Club, and the NAACP, we thank you. Um, we thank you because it, at least we're encouraged by the fact that you guys have well thought out what this job entails, what needs to be done, and a plan to attack. And that's encouraging. At least we have candidates who are knowledgeable and have a desire to serve. So on behalf of all the organizations and people in this audience, I say thank you very much. Would you join me in thanking Mayor Davis for his work? We thank the candidates and thank the organizations. This is the most critical time in our nation's history. We can say that with every election, but I think anyone who's watched the news for 10 minutes can see not just exploding deficits, not just a lack of integrity and honor, but a lack of civility in our community. And if we look in this crowd, we see people of every gender, every orientation, every race, every educational background, we have the ability to make good, smart choices. The first good, smart choice we have before us is the fact that only a few candidates showed up, and one who could not show up sent a video. That means the candidates who showed up or who could not and sent a video thought you mattered. Those who didn't thought something different. So we need to be clear that if a person isn't willing to talk to you, they're not willing to work for you. Secondly, it's very critical that we understand that all of our candidates gave us substantive conversation. I invite you to read their websites, to contact them. Vallejo has a lot at stake in this election. We can no longer afford to be seen as the orphan in this county. We need people who will seriously advocate for this city and the people in this city. And so I'm grateful for the work that our candidates have already talked about that they are doing, for the things that they're doing, but we also need to hold accountable the districts up to up county, those districts that do not directly represent us, but yet directly impact us. And so it's important that we hold all of the districts, and that's why the Community Democratic Club was not interested in just having District 2 or District 1 here. We invited all the districts because we cannot only view the ones in our direct locale. The last thing I want to say on behalf of the club is every year the Community Democratic Club is growing. In just a week and a half, we had 75 new members joining this club. Our club has already, over the last several years, had a major impact. The last forum that we did was for school board. We endorsed after that forum. Every candidate we endorsed won election. And so we have a track record. We have a track record of engaging substantive conversation, putting out good recommendations, and helping our members make smart choices. We will be doing the same after this forum. The board will be getting together. We'll be making recommendations to our members, and we will publish the recommendations. Let me just say that as a club, we operate in integrity. We did not endorse anybody before we heard their points of view. So we want that point of view. We don't see this as a popularity contest because our children are impacted, our seniors are impacted, homeless are impacted by the answers that were given. So once again, we appreciate you taking the time to either be here or send a video to give us your voice and your thoughts on issues. Lastly, join me one more time in celebrating the other organizations, the NAACP, the African American I want to thank the staff of Friendship Missionary Baptist Church who are here tonight operating the cameras, making sure we were set up. I'm going to ask the board members of the 
the Community Democratic Club just to stand up very quickly so that we can see the board members who organized this and make sure. Lastly, I want to acknowledge the other elected officials that were not on stage who are in the House. If you are an elected official and you're representing a constituency, would you stand wherever you are so that we can acknowledge you as well if you are here? Thank you for all of our elected officials. We honor and celebrate your commitment to this community by showing up. If you want to view this again, it is on the Community Democratic page, Facebook page. You can share it if people were on the commute, people were in choir rehearsal, wherever they are, they'll have an opportunity to go to our page and hear the candidates' answers over and over again. This is a critical election. Let's give it critical attention. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful night. Give yourself a hand. Feel free to meet the candidates as they